good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for following us online in the uh, morning. And I really appreciate for all of your participation. And today, uh, uh, it is our great pleasure to have our distinguished guest, Professor Lawrence Goldstein, uh, who is the professor from Georgetown University and also the author of the Global Health Law. And uh, also, he served as the director for World Health Organization Collaborating Center on Public Health Law and Human Rights. And today, uh, we have pleasure to invite uh, Professor Goldstein uh, to share about his insight for the uh, global health, uh, health law. Given, uh, I think, in 2020, that the COVID uh, situation uh, particularly raised the awareness to uh, rethink about our global health law and how do we uh, maybe really structure and to collaborate both regionally and globally. So I think today it is really uh, our honor to have Professor Gostin uh, with us. So Professor Gostin, if you are ready, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor for me uh, to be here. Um, one of the most, uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of is, is that my book on global health law um, from Harvard University Press um, has been translated uh, into both simplified and traditional Chinese. Um, and uh, as well, my, my, my book, Public Health Law, has also been translated um, into uh, 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 Mandarin, so it's really uh, quite an honor for me. Um, I've, I have many, many friends in China, um, and before this pandemic, I, I would come to uh, all the different parts of uh, your, your wonderful country um, uh, every year. Um, and I've actually been coming since uh, you know 1990. So I was here when Beijing was just all bicycles, but it's not that anymore. I can tell you. Um, well. Uh, my book on global health law um, tries to demonstrate that um, if we have strong institutions like the World Health Organization and we have strong um, international legal uh, system uh, like uh, the international health regulations and if we abide by the rule of law, um, then we can do an enormous amount of good um, in preventing uh, injuries and diseases um, and controlling them. And so my book um, talks about um, infectious diseases ranging from AIDS uh, uh, through to uh, tuberculosis, um, uh, Zika, Ebola, and uh, of course now is the great COVID pandemic. Um, but it also talks about non-communicable diseases, um, which are a major problem all over the world, including China. Um, uh, tobacco related diseases uh, like respiratory diseases, also respiratory diseases from pollution, um, uh, diabetes, cancer, um, uh, cardiovascular diseases caused by um, uh, poor diets and inadequate physical activity, um, and injuries, um, particularly in the Asian region, um, um, places like um, Southeast Asia, um, there are massive injuries, uh, as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, from automobile crashes and many, many other um, hazards. So um, my book is really um, the first and I still think the only book on global health law. Um, and what ha has happened since the publication of the book has been a real um, lesson in why we need strong public health laws. Um, as we all know, um, 
you know, sometime in December of 2019, uh, there was a zoonotical leap uh, uh, from a bat to an intermediary animal um, to a human, uh, most likely at the Wuhan wet market. Um, this uh, quickly spread um, to wider Hubei province, uh, mainland China, um, throughout um, Asia, uh, then to Europe, um, North America, and now the entire world. Um, and we have the greatest pandemic in the last hundred years since the 1918 great influenza pandemic. Um, and law has become very important. I know very early on, I worked with my friends at uh, Tsinghua University, Peking and other universities um, and the Ministry of Health uh, to try to look at the emergency powers laws um, in China. Um, after uh, the attacks on New York City and the World Trade Center um, uh, in 9-11 and then the anthrax attacks, I wrote a model emergency health powers law for the United States. Um, and so law at the national level, public health laws, emergency health laws are critically important um, for the tools that we need to stop a pandemic. Uh, everything from uh, testing, contact tracing, um, isolation um, and uh, quarantine, um, and even major lockdowns as we saw in Wuhan, Beijing, uh, Rome, New York, Paris, Delhi, everywhere in the world, um, really. Um, so these are all possible by the rule of law. Um, as well, we're now entering a new phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is, we hope that is the final phase, which is the vaccination phase. Um, China has uh, five um, a stage three, phase three clinical trial vaccine candidates. Um, the United States Food and Drug Administration is probably going to give emergency use authorization uh, to two additional vaccines uh, from Moderna and Pfizer. Um, and uh, there's a promising vaccine um, uh, from AstraZeneca uh, and Oxford University in the UK. Um, and so the law will tell us about how we can vaccinate the population, um, uh, whether we can use mandatory means for vaccination um, and which populations to vaccinate. So law has become a really important tool in global health. Um, but in addition to um, public health laws at the national level, um, we also have very important global health laws. Um, we have them, for example, with um, the international health regulations. Uh, these are the regulations that govern pandemic response. Um, they're a WHO uh, treaty, um, both China and the United States and 196 state parties, virtually the entire world um, have joined. Um, and there's been great controversy around uh, the international health regulations, particularly related to um, travel restrictions um, and related to whether countries have abided um, by the World Health Organization recommendations under the international health regulations. Um, there's also controversy about um, the early origins of uh, the uh, pandemic uh, in Wuhan. And currently there's a joint China World Health Organization inquiry uh, into the origins of that original uh, zoonotic leap um, uh, in Wuhan and what the circumstances of that are. And so the international health regulations um, governs, you know, what diseases we report, how quickly we report, whether we have the uh, health systems that we need to respond, including lab laboratory uh, health systems, uh, 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 surveillance, testing, 
um, contact tracing, quarantine, uh, and the like. All of these are within the international health regulations. And there's currently a WHO commission that's looking into um, uh, WHO reform, but as well looking at the uh, reform of the international health regulations. Um, and uh, uh, tomorrow, it'll be my Tuesday and your Wednesday, um, uh, The Lancet is going to be uh, publishing a, a comment from myself and uh, many colleagues of mine, including former heads of the US Centers for Disease Control, former FDA commissioners, former Health and Human Services uh, secretaries um, on what the Biden administration should do um, to strengthen global health um, uh, response. Uh, one of the things, of course, that, that we need to do uh, is work cooperatively together. Uh, China and the United States are the two great world superpowers. Um, we can't be fighting with one another. Uh, I don't believe our people are fighting, but our governments are fighting. Um, and we have to find a way um, that we can jointly respond to the major global problems facing the world. Um, and the two most important of those are pandemic preparedness and this COVID response um, and climate change. Uh, and I do believe that, um, uh, that working together, China and the United States can do much more than when we work separately. Now, one of the most destructive things about the Chinese American relationship has been to catch, to, to place WHO, the World Health Organization, in the middle of the of geopolitical tensions. Uh, and that's just unjustified. Uh, we need a strong World Health Organization. Um, and I've worked with the World Health Organization for many, many years. I'm the director of their um, uh, Center uh, on uh, National and Global Health Law. Um, and I realize that WHO is not perfect, um, but it's very important. And Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization has been a great warrior um, with great compassion and great wisdom in fighting COVID-19. Uh, and before him, um, I worked very closely with Margaret Chan, who's Chinese. Um, and Margaret um, dealt with um, uh, the H1N1 uh, uh, pandemic and other uh, emergency responses, including the West African Ebola response. Uh, and so uh, many people think of law as um, a unimportant. Um, they think of uh, when we're, we're fighting pandemics or whether we're fighting cancer or heart disease, they think we have to turn only to science and medicine. But in fact, law may be just as important as science and medicine. And the reason is, is, is that we, we fight diseases and injuries through legal rules, um, through policies, through laws, through regulations. Um, we use regulations to help us stay safe and healthy. Um, we do it you know, to keep uh, workers safe, for example, in mines. Uh, we do it to keep um, uh, pedestrians and cyclists and um, uh, car drivers safe. Um, by safety rules, um, speed limits, uh, uh, airbags, and things like that. Um, and we do it um, through um, public health laws, um, laws that you know, try to provide public health authorities with the powers that they need um, to uh, respond to uh, health emergencies. Um, now, right now, um, China has done extraordinarily well in uh, stemming uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but there's always a risk that it could resurge in China. 
um, one day travel restrictions will be lifted. I'll be coming back to uh, Beijing. In fact, in next October, I was invited to go to Wuhan. Um, and, uh, and so we, we need to recognize that no one is safe from COVID unless everyone is safe. And so we have to make sure now that we face probably the greatest challenges of our lifetimes. And that is rolling out in a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine to the entire world, not just richer countries like China, the United States, Europe, Canada, um, but also middle-income countries like Brazil and India, um, and also low-income countries, um, places in Africa, Latin America. Um, we need to make sure that every person on this earth um, gets the kind of treatment and vaccination that they need to keep them healthy and safe. It shouldn't matter where you live, whether you're a man or a woman, uh, what race or religion you are, and it shouldn't matter whether you're rich or poor. Um, everyone has the right to health. And so my book um, is about two things really. Um, I posit that we need a world uh, that values both global health and justice. And that we need both, not just one. Global health means we need ever improving health outcomes with longer life expectancies, fighting diseases like AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, fighting non-communicable diseases like cancer, diabetes and heart disease, fighting injuries. Um, and we also need justice. That is, we can't have huge health inequalities around the world. Uh, we need to have everybody having equal entitlement to human health and well being. And I believe that um, you know, many parts of the world feel very badly aggrieved um, that the rich lead healthier lives, live longer than the poor do. Um, and they, people don't want to be left behind. They're angry, they're fed up of, of not getting the kinds of uh, opportunities for health and productivity that richer people have. And so my book is about these two fundamental goals, ever improving global health and global health with justice and equality. Um, I hope you will read the book. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to answering any questions that I might have and one day to return to China uh, and to meet many of you. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to the questions uh, during the next uh, part of our conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Goldstein, uh, to really provide us the comprehensive landscape in terms of your book and also the global health laws um, uh, history and also the background. So uh, the first question, um, as a big fan of your book, uh, although that I'm leading the Master of Finance, but actually I study for my bachelor, master, and uh, also PhD in law. So I think uh, today is really great to learn from you. So uh, the first question is really uh, focusing on uh, let you briefly mention uh, the law. Sometimes uh, when we talk about the global health, uh, normally people firstly, they think about the medical doctor, they think about the pharmaceutical company or pharmaceutical uh, expert for vaccine, and maybe less uh, discussion on the global uh, health law and how the lawyer and the legal scholar can contribute. So um, in terms of the global health law, uh, what topic might be covered and also uh, how lawyer and the legal scholar can contribute their expertise uh, to global health? Those are very good questions. Um, 
You know, I think that lawyers can play a very important role. Um, you know, uh, you can work um, at your country level to help improve um, public health laws and emergency health powers laws um, in your country, like China, um, or in your um, uh, province or your city um, to work with uh, legislators and policymakers um, and ministers of health um, to try to formulate strong legal powers and protections of uh, public health and safety. Um, we lawyers are able to really do a lot of good. Um, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, listed the 10 greatest public health achievements of the 20th century. And virtually all 10 of them were achieved through law, um, like tobacco control um, with uh, restrictions on advertising, um, taxation, um, things like childhood vaccination with mandatory vaccination um, requirements, things like car safety with seat belts and speed limits and uh, drunk driving um, uh, legislation. Uh, there's so much uh, that law can do at the national level, um, but law can also do a lot at the international level. Um, we're very good at understanding as lawyers, things like uh, governance and institutions. Uh, and so working with uh, institutions like the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, um, the United Nations, UNICEF, uh, the Global Fund, the Gavi Alliance, CEPI, all of these international agencies, um, we, need to, we need good governance. We need transparency, effectiveness, accountability, um, and law can uniquely do that. Um, you know, I'll send you, if you remind me, a, a link to a, a Lancet Commission report that I chaired uh, it's called the Legal Determinants of Health. It's a major study that shows how law can be a tool for the public's health. And it tries to show, and I think does show, um, that legal determinants, laws, policies, governance, the rule of law, have just as an important effect, maybe more important than other determinants of health, including medicine and science. Um, and my book covers all of that, but it also covers specific areas. Um, it has a chapter on um, non-communicable diseases. It has one on the AIDS pandemic. It has one on universal health coverage systems. Um, it has one on um, uh, pandemic preparedness. Um, ver various, and one on the World Health Organization and many, many more. Um, so it's intended to be a, a, a book that you can use to study the field, but also um, many universities, in, including China, the United States, Europe, Australia, use the book in global health classes. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gorski. So the next question, we would like to get your perspective uh, as we, uh, I think I'm sure that like the global has no uh, is very important. So do you see any factor that might accelerate the importance of that? For example, uh, globalization obviously might be one of factor to lead the frequency of pandemic. Even people have more opportunity to travel around the world. Uh, but do you see any additional factor that might accelerate the phenomenon of this and which uh, people should take into consideration? Yes, I mean, I think a lot of the world is, uh, is, is um, fighting against globalization now with all the populism and nationalism. Um, but I think it's a, it's a fact of life. Um, you, can, you can travel anywhere in the world in 48 to 72 hours. 
And so a pathogen can uh, get on a plane inside of a human being uh, or inside of an animal and be anywhere in the world in a matter of hours. Um, we have um, uh, uh, viruses and others that are in animal populations. And so, for example, um, a circulating uh, influenza viruses that are zoonotic in China, um, uh, uh, HN, uh, H5N1, so-called bird flus. They can fly on migratory bird patterns anywhere in the world. Um, we see international trade and commerce. Um, uh, we see globalization of consumer products like alcohol, um, food, tobacco, um, all of which play a major uh, role in injury and disease. And so I do think that uh, it's become extraordinarily clear that no country acting alone can deal with health problems. We need to act together. And the only way we can do that is with global health law. Right. Um, and so that is extraordinarily important. And of course, the, the best example of that um, was the uh, zoonotic leap in the Wuhan wet market. You have one little bat that bites another animal and then the virus jumps to a human. And within a matter of weeks or months, it's a global pandemic. And that's the force, you know, we're facing an awesome force of nature. And the way I think of the COVID pandemic is, is we have two of the most awesome forces fighting against each other. We have this tiny little virus that none, none of us can even see and yet it's controlled literally every life on the planet. Every human life has been controlled by this little virus. Um, so the power of mother nature is spectacular. Um, but against that, uh, we have human ingenuity in science. Um, we have scientists that in China within a week after the first report to WHO genetically sequenced uh, SARS-CoV-2, the, the coronavirus, and shared it with the world. Um, we have uh, new therapeutics, we have vaccines uh, on the horizon. Um, and so we have uh, human science and ingenuity uh, fighting against mother nature. And the way I like to think of law is, is that, you know, we're the referee and we make sure that everybody fights fair. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Ghosty. So I think following your discussion on uh, how that we uh, could collaborate uh, globally, uh, I was uh, thinking about one question. Do you see any difference between COVID-19 and the pandemic happened before? Because it seems to me uh, when we talk about how to collaborate globally, it seems to me that uh, thanks to technology, thanks to transportation, uh, probably it's much more easy in terms of communication. So what do you think that might be the problems uh, right now at the moment for the pandemic this time and any difference between this time and the pandemic happened before? And what kind of measure we should take into consideration? Yeah, I mean, I should just say we've had many pandemics before, right. including H1N1 and the AIDS pandemic, but I'm assuming you're talking about the great influenza pandemic right. um, of 1918, um, which is the, the, the greatest similarity. Of course, that was a world where we did not have globalization, and now we have the means um, for communication and contact among countries. You know, I think there's good news and there's bad news. Um, first, the bad news um, is, is that uh, COVID has not brought governments together. It's made them fight with one another. Um, 
China, Europe, Australia, the United States um, are splintering and fighting over the COVID pandemic. Um, we've also seen vaccine nationalism where countries have bought up advanced supplies of vaccines, including in Europe, Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, even India and, some, and China, but, not, but less so for India and China. Um, and uh, we've seen the World Health Organization be highly politicized. These are all terrible things because we're, we're in this together and the only way we can deal with it is, is as a global community, but we splintered. Um, that's the bad news. Another piece of bad news is, is that while communication channels are much more advanced than they've ever been in the past, they've also spurned a lot of disinformation and conspiracy theories. Um, and so false, false claims have spread like wildfire. And populist leaders like Bolsonaro in, in uh, Brazil, um, President Trump in the United States, have tended to amplify these false narratives. Um, and so that, and that, those, are, those are very destructive of science and public trust. On the other hand, um, uh, there are some things we've done extraordinarily well. I think governments have not behaved very cooperatively on this, but scientists have. There's been a lot of good science to science cooperation. Chinese and American scientists, European scientists, scientists from India, Israel, and other places around the world have cooperated, I think, you know, quite well. Um, including sharing um, uh, genomic uh, sequencing data and other, um, and other important information. Uh, and so I think that's worked uh, quite well with, with, with people and scientists working with one another um, across the spectrum. Um, but I think we do need to do better. Um, we need to really come together and, and um, support the World Health Organization and strengthen it. Um, the, the major powers in the world need to come together, the UN Security Council, the G7 group of nations, the G20, um, need to do much, much more to work together um, on this pandemic. Um, and so uh, when this pandemic is over, I think we have two paths. We can either take a path where we uh, go back to nationalism and populism, um, where we go back to uh, leaders uh, arguing with one another as has happened with Xi Jinping and Donald Trump, um, or we can have visionary leaders that will work together. Uh, and, I, and I hope that we will work together and put the World Health Organization at the center of all cooperative efforts. Thank you very much, Professor Goldstein. So I think uh, previously we are much more focusing on uh, the measure or the solution uh, at the global level. So do you see any like the domestic factor that this COVID-19 to keep spread, uh, spreading in a certain region? Uh, if so, what kind of action could they take domestically? So uh, the question is that, do you see any, uh, maybe the best practice or not really the best practice, but the lesson learned in the last 10 to 11 months? Yes, in fact, I wrote an article for the Journal of the American Medical Association on the, on the 11 greatest lessons of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I, I'll try to also remember to send that to you if you can remind me. Um, you know, I think, you know, some countries in the world have done extraordinarily well um, in containing COVID. Um, um, many Asian countries like China um, uh, and uh, South Korea 
um, have done uh, extraordinarily well, Singapore and others. Um, uh, New Zealand has done well, Australia, uh, Germany has done well. Um, but then there are certain countries that have done very, very poorly. Um, I'm very sad to say the United States has done badly, Brazil, um, Russia um, has done badly, India um, and other countries have, um, have underperformed. They have much better health systems than, and should have performed much better, particularly European countries like the UK and um, uh, France and Italy um, have not performed uh, well. Um, and so what separates those who have been successful and those who have not? I think mostly it's adherence to science. Um, did the population follow scientific advice? Um, that is um, locking down when they needed to, um, everyone wearing masks, everyone um, social distancing, um, everyone um, uh, uh, contact trace, uh, making themselves available for contact tracing and self-isolating. And then as soon as there's a case or a cluster to go early and hard at containing it. There's no good right now, for example, in Europe, everybody's debating, well, we've locked down or should we lock down again? But to me, the question isn't, should we lock down? The question is, what should we do after we've locked down? What's our plan? You can't just lock down and then go back and do the same thing again, which is what many Western countries have done. Um, and so I think following science, having trust in public health agencies, um, supporting the World Health Organization, um, uh, these have been really critically important. I think also, um, uh, rapid and mass uh, testing and contact tracing um, have been very important parts of this. Uh, in China and many other parts of Asia, um, there's been used, uh, you've used location app applications on your smartphones. These have been much less used for privacy reasons in the United States and Europe. Um, but there are many uh, good examples, ultimately, uh, many countries have done well with different strategies, but what the strategy that everyone uses in common um, is uh, to gain the public's trust through science. And that's the most critical lesson, I think. So the trust is very important. Yes. So I think um, talking about the lockdown, uh, maybe as uh, lawyers that uh, I would like to uh, talk also address uh, some of the discussion on the constitutional concern. As that uh, when we have the quarantine measure or the prioritizing the minority for coronavirus vaccination, I think people talks a lot about like uh, for the legal concerns and also uh, some issue related to the constitutional law uh, in uh, both regionally and globally. So do you see any constitutional issue for uh, those measure or those like action for, for COVID-19? And uh, what kind of lesson learned uh, we can uh, take away and uh, for uh, maybe better uh, performance next time? Yeah, I mean, this is um, quite important. Um, the, the uh, you know, when I wrote the um, model emergency health powers law for the US CDC, um, I had anticipated um, virtually all of the kinds of public health law measures that countries would use. Um, testing, screening, contact tracing, isolation, quarantine. But I couldn't have ever imagined in my wildest dreams that we would lock down a city as large as Wuhan or Beijing, um, or that we would see Paris, London, Rome, New York, and even Delhi completely locked down. 
This is unprecedented in the history of the world uh, of lockdowns of that uh, nature. Um, from a constitutional point of view, the question is, um, is the lockdown or whatever measure we're thinking about, um, is there evidence to show that it can be effective? Secondly, are there any less restrictive ways um, to be just as effective? Um, that is by uh, using measures that are less restrictive of liberty and privacy, could we um, uh, gain control? And above all, um, we need to abide by the rule of law, um, which is to say that um, there are many countries in the world where leaders have used the COVID emergency as an excuse to expand their own powers. Um, the United Nations is very concerned about this as I am. Um, and so, you know, for me, from a constitutional point of view, both nationally and globally, um, the key issues are, um, one, um, is there evidence that it's effective and necessary? Uh, two, could we do it in ways that are less restrictive? Three, is this a proportionate measure um, necessary to reduce uh, the risk and save lives? And four, are there fair procedures? That is, um, is, is the rule of law available for people to appeal against uh, unjust uh, restrictions on their liberty and privacy? These are the key questions. They all go to the rule of law. Yeah. Um, some countries have done it well, um, but many countries have not. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Goldstein. And I think for, for this issue, um, some, somehow I feel it will be really like a dilemma given uh, because the situation is very in emergency and uh, it's also quite new. And uh, obviously people have no time to test whether that the measure is effective or not. So I think that will be a difficult uh, point for that. It will. It will. We're in a... We're, in a, in, we're always acting with some scientific uncertainty in an emergency. And that's why you need to give public health authorities right. some discretion, um, but, not, but still needs to be uh, within the bounds of reasonableness. Right, right, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor Goldstein. So I think really appreciate for your very bold time today. I think uh, as a big fan of your book, I really feel that when I read your book, it just like uh, helped me to climb the mountain. Let me see uh, not just the detail, but also the comprehensive landscape. Uh, but when I talk to you today, it also made me from this mountain to another higher mountain uh, to see the beauty uh, of the world and uh, to see like the much more comprehensive landscape. So really appreciate for your time, given as we know, now it is that evening in the United States. So really appreciate for joining us and the support the initiative for our webinar. Well, thank you for your very kind words. And it's a great privilege to be with you and all of my friends in China. Um, and uh, I, uh, I hope to visit uh, one day soon and talk about global health law. So thank you. Um, and good morning to you and good evening to me. Yes, absolutely. And I hope we have pleasure to host you in China uh, and uh, meet you in person in the near future. That would be wonderful. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Stay in touch. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone.